All right, everybody, we're coming at you with another fight announcements video. This time it's going to be around four to five fights that have recently been announced within the last 24 to 48 hours with some bangers that have been announced for upcoming cards, upcoming pay-per-views. And we're going to kick it off in the featherweight division between Bryce Thug Nasty Mitchell, who's coming off of that knockout loss to Ilya Taporia, going up against Dan 50K Ige, who's coming off of that decision victory over Nate the Train Landor. Um, Landor, or I'm sorry, not even Landor, what am I talking about? Dan Ige and Bryce Mitchell, man, we obviously know what we're going to expect here. Mitchell is not going to be able to stick around on the feet against Dan Ige. There's no way he strikes with 50K. He got knocked out by... Ilya Taporia, or I'm sorry, got submitted, but got dropped multiple times, and you know, we just saw what Taporia did to Josh Emmett, so I don't think you can really fault him too much for that, but he's been away for a minute, the, the fight with Taporia was at UFC 282, they both came in undefeated, and although Mitchell got some early takedowns, he wasn't really able to do too much with it, and just got picked apart, butchered on the feet, and then submitted in his area of the game, in his wheelhouse, in the jiu-jitsu, with an arm triangle choke, and with Bryce Mitchell going up against Ige, I definitely think think he's going to have the wrestling advantage. He's going to have the takedown advantage. Um, he did get taken down by the Korean Zombie, did 50k, so that is something you have to look out for, but he also got outstruck by the Korean Zombie as well, got dropped, got rocked in the fight, so when you look at this fight, I do think it's really as simple as if Dan Ige stops the takedowns of Bryce Mitchell, he closes the distance in the pocket and lands his beautiful boxing combinations and pieces up Bryce Mitchell, but if Mitchell can get in on the hips of Dan Ige, get the takedowns, control from the top position, work his way into mount, you know, look for twisters, look for arm bars, look for chills. I think he out grapples Dan Ige every day of the week, but Ige is not an easy guy to take down, so you do have to keep that in the back of your mind. I definitely think it stays on the feet. If it's in kicking range, um, you could probably give the advantage to Mitchell because he does throw some weird hook kicks, spinning kicks, and things like that from the outside, and he did drop Edson Barbosa with a 3-2 uh, up against the cage, so he does have some power in his hands, but the bread and butter of Bryce Mitchell against Ige is going to be getting in on the hips of Ige, taking him down, working from the top position, suffocating him with the pressure, you know, transitioning into side control, transitioning to take the back, getting into full mount, landing ground and pound, and looking to set up a submission. If he's able to continually get takedowns, then I think Bryce Mitchell wins this fight via decision, but I honestly kind of see 50k... Uh, stuffing some early takedowns and then landing on the chin of Bryce Mitchell and knocking him out. Uh, you know, I know he looked decent against Aporia early on, but I think that that loss really affected him mentally, and then he got injured before he was supposed to take on uh, Movsar Evloev. So, you know, it is a tough fight for Mitchell, but I do think this is a winnable fight for him against Ige, but at the same time, I don't think Ige is going to be hard or going to be easy to take down, and if this fight stays on the feet, you know, even at kicking range, like, even though you kind of have to give the advantage to Mitchell, I still think if you stay on the feet, you know, you're going to have the stance changing combinations, the 3-2, the beautiful left hook of Ige, the 1-2-3, the ripping shots to the body, you know, using that jab to measure and firing that right hand. I think if it stays on the feet, Ige catches Bryce Mitchell and hurts him bad and probably knocks him out. Uh, early lean, I'm actually going to lean with Dan Ige to win this fight early on. I just... I know that Mitchell was undefeated before the fight with Taporia. I know that Taporia would probably butcher Dan Ige as well. But I just think that this is a pretty bad matchup for Mitchell. Um, you know, Ige can get taken down. He can get out-wrestled. We saw it against Ivloyev. But at the same time, I kind of think he's got, he can beat a guy like Bryce Mitchell. I think he can keep it on the feet and land some shots and hurt Bryce Mitchell and knock him out. Or just butcher him to a decision because Mitchell is a durable guy. But... I don't like how many, how long he's taken, or how much time he's taken off since his last loss to Taporia, or his first loss in his professional MMA career, so I am going to lean ever so slightly for Ige to box up Mitchell, but yeah, that's my early lean for that fight. All right, the next fight we're going to talk about is again in the featherweight division, and it's going to be at the same event on August 26th for UFC Singapore between the returning Giga Chikadze going up against Alex Bruce Leroy Caceres, who's coming off of that victory over Daniel the Pitt Pineda. Um, man, Caceres is a guy that everybody's kind of counted out for his entire mixed martial arts career. You know, even on the Ultimate Fighter, when he came in with that Bruce Lee style, uh, not even a singlet, but a bodysuit. And, you know, he was obviously inspired by the Last Dragon movie from the 80s, you know, Bruce Leroy and the glow. Um, he's been counted out in almost all of his fights and he still finds ways to win he still is competitive even in the fight he lost to super Sadiq Yusuf he was very competitive and they went strike for strike and Yusuf's the guy we're going to talk about in a little bit but 
you know, Giga Chikadze is a different level, but they have different styles of striking. You know, Chikadze is kind of similar with that in and out footwork, you know, in and out light on the feet, but the power advantage for Giga Chikadze is a big problem. But we haven't seen Giga Chikadze since he lost via that dominant decision and just butchering from Kelvin Cater, who kind of showed that there was levels to this and levels to the MMA game. And there's a big difference between the top level of the 145 pound division and the mid level between like ranks five through 10. You know, the top five, it's a different level. And Giga got butchered with elbows. He was getting caught with elbows stepping in. The jab from Kelvin Cater spinning elbows. I mean, it was a really a masterclass from Kelvin Cater and even used some of his wrestling. But you see what Giga Chikadze did to a guy like Edson Barbosa. And he beat him at his own game. Beat him in the striking. And I think that Giga is a tough, durable fighter. But we haven't seen him since 2021. Uh, early 2021, I believe. It was either the end of 2020 or early 2021. And... Um, I think that this is a very close matchup on paper. I think that the more creative attacks, um, the, the kicks from different angles, the delayed and the delayed kick timing of Alex Caceres can catch a guy who's kind of more technique based and more by the book, you know, uh, technique for technique, paint by numbers like Chikadze, but the power and the speed, uh, I would say speed is kind of 50-50, but the power from Giga Chikadze is the biggest difference in this matchup. But at the same time, if he can wrestle take down Giga Chikadze, use his jujitsu that we've seen him use in his MMA career before. He's got good chokes. He's got good work off of his back, good reversals, good top position, good ability to look for submissions. And even though he has been submitted multiple times in his career, he was able to survive against a guy in Daniel Pineda, who's a very dangerous Brazilian jujitsu black belt who has submitted a lot of guys in his mixed martial arts career. So you have to give Caceres, the, you know, a, a tip of the hat and a feather in his cap for how much better his defensive jujitsu and even his offensive submission attack attempts have gotten and I do think if it gets to the ground that Caceres is going to have an advantage over Chikadze who is always going to want to keep it on the feet and it's kind of a fish out of water if the fight goes to the mat so I definitely think if Caceres wants to win um, he will have a speed advantage it, it's pretty close but I almost give the speed advantage to Caceres I give the power advantage the finishing ability upside to Giga Chikadze but at the same time you don't know what kind of Chikadze we're going to get after being gone for so long and taking so much time off and then I think he had an injury he was supposed to fight Sadiq Youssef and that fight ended up falling out I believe you can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong but early lean for this fight I think it's about time I stopped counting out Bruce Leroy um, so I'm actually going to lean ever so slightly to Bruce Leroy Alex Caceres who's probably going to be an underdog and a pretty heavy underdog going into this matchup. I like the jujitsu. I like the grappling upside. I like the ability to mix up his game if the striking isn't going as well. Um, I like the activity from Bruce Leroy. And yeah, I'm going to lean with him. I think the uh, delayed timing in the kicks, the awkward angles that his kicks come from, and the wrestling and submission ability that he has can lead him to either catching Giga with a big head kick and knocking him out or taking him down winning a scramble and choking him out. I'm going to go with uh, Alex Caceres as an early lean and to win this fight against Giga Chikadze via submission. I think he catches him in a guillotine or a rear naked choke and forces Giga to tap. I do not like the layoff. I do not like the inactivity. So give me Bruce Leroy, Alex Caceres against Giga Chikadze. The next fight up and the next one we're going to discuss is a banger in the welterweight division that's going to take place on September 16th at UFC Nosh or Nosh UFC, Notch UFC between Santiago, the Argentine dagger, Ponzinibbio facing Daniel D-Rod Rodriguez. Rodriguez versus Ponzinibbio is a striker's delight. The, the main weapon and the main aspects of this fight is going to be Southpaw versus Orthodox. You have the Orthodox striker, Orthodox boxer, but also a kickboxer, but more of a boxer. He likes to use his hands more. And Santiago Ponzinibbio, who's going to be moving laterally, moving in and out, sticking the jab in the face of Daniel Rodriguez and trying to find a target for that missile of a right cross that we've seen him knock out guys like um who's the guy he knocked out early it was the biggest one of his career neil magny uh alex morono he's knocked out a lot of guys and he's even had very successful and competitive fights against the likes of jeff neal and when I look at Daniel D. Rod Rodriguez, he's going to be southpaw, so he's going to be using that check right hook against the orthodox fighter in Ponzinibbio, who's going to be he's going to be trying to step that lead right foot to the outside of the lead left foot of Ponzinibbio and using a jab, changing it between the jab to the check hook, and then finding a pathway to land that straight left hand right down the middle. There's a big power advantage in this fight, I believe, from Daniel D. Rod Rodriguez. I would say a kicking advantage goes ever so slightly to Daniel Rodriguez. If anybody's going to resort to using the wrestling and the takedowns, I would 
almost say that it has to be D-Rod. I think that they're both going to entertain a striking matchup, but if somebody resorts to their grappling, takedowns, and wrestling, I think that would come from D-Rod. Even though he's not the best and he's shown a lot of inefficiencies with his defensive grappling, I don't see Ponzinibbio being the guy to use the takedown and the wrestling, or use the takedowns and the wrestling offensively, he would more use it defensively, but I think the jab of Ponzinibbio can be a big problem for D-Rod, um, I'm not sure on the height and reach at this point, but I would venture to say I think Ponzinibbio would have a reach advantage, but I could be wrong, like I said, I didn't look at stats or anything before I started this video, but it's going to be Southpaw versus Orthodox, the outside foot positioning battle, it's going to be the check right hook and the straight left hand of D-Rod versus the jab, the double jab, the triple jab, the right hand, the left hook behind it, I think the better combination puncher is uh, Santiago Ponzinibbio, but I think the better more technical boxer in terms of technique and better defense would be Daniel D-Rod Rodriguez. I'm going to lean D-Rod in this fight as an early pick because I feel like he has a little bit more left in the tank. I know that's a lot to say considering he just got knocked out by Ian Gary in the first round and that was a fight I did pick Daniel Rodriguez in, but I think he has a little bit more left to offer in his mixed martial arts career at this point and he's only losing to, you know, prospects and not really prospects, but very highly touted undefeated fighters in the top of the division. And Ponzinibbio is kind of the same, but I think that D-Rod has a little bit more left. I think he's more durable. I think he can, he can take the shots of Ponzinibbio, while Ponzinibbio more than likely won't be able to take the power of Daniel Rodriguez. I think Rodriguez hurts him and eventually gets him out of there with a TKO, but it is a very close fight, and I could see Ponzinibbio sticking that jab in the face of D-Rod, keeping that outside foot, and continuing to find the pathway for that right hand behind the double and triple jab, but the early lean is Rodriguez by TKO. Up next, we're in the featherweight division with a banger and a rebooking of sorts of a fight that was originally set to take place, I believe, around six to eight months ago, and it's going to be rebooked for UFC Vegas 81 on October 14th in the featherweight division between Edson Jr. Barbosa and the returning Super Sadiq Youssef. Youssef versus Barbosa is going to be a banger. It's kind of like D-Rod and... His opponent in Santiago Ponzinibbio that we just discussed, man. This is going to be a striker's delight. I don't see a whole lot of grappling. I see a lot of heavy boxing from Sadiq Youssef and a heavy kickboxing and Muay Thai based game from Edson Jr. Barbosa. I think we know for a fact that the speed advantage is going to come from Edson Barbosa. He's one of the fastest fighters or was one of the fastest fighters in the UFC's lightweight division. I mean that spinning back kick or wheel kick knockout on Terry Adam. The beautiful overhand right knockout against uh, Shane Burgos at 145 pounds, you know, kind of butchering Dan Ige, but then losing a controversial decision. Um, you know, Barbosa has shown to be very successful in the featherweight division, a dominating performance against Makwan Amir Khani. And I think a lot of people didn't expect him to be able to make the weight at a healthy you know, rate and make the weight in a healthy way. And he did. And he was very, very successful in that division. Um, lost to Giga Chikadze. Has lost some other fights in the division as well. Like I said, lost that controversial decision to Dan Ige in his featherweight debut. But Sadiq Youssef is a very good boxer. He uses a very good jab. He has very good timing on his right hand. Uh, he mixes up his kicks as well. We saw against Arnold Allen, it was a very competitive fight. But Allen just landed the bigger shots, the bigger head kicks, the bigger 1-2, controlling the lead hand and throwing that straight left against the orthodox fighter in Youssef. Youssef will switch stances as well. He'll move between orthodox and southpaw. And I think the boxing of Yusuf and the timing can give Barbosa some trouble to be honest but uh you know he has great takedown defense so I don't see Yusuf being able to resort to the wrestling but I really think the speed and power of Barbosa is going to be a little bit too much for Super Sadiq I mean we saw him get dropped and knocked down by Arnold Allen who does have a lot of power who did knock out Dan Hooker even though it was a very depleted Dan Hooker trying to make the weight at 145 kind of like Dillashaw dropping down to 125 to fight Cejudo and you know etc etc even though it was scientific his brain didn't have enough time to rehydrate and he was basically killing himself to make the weight considering he's a very big lightweight um, I think the speed and power of Barbosa is just going to be too much for Yusuf but if Yusuf can stick behind that jab use those stance changes between orthodox and southpaw mix up the inside low kicks when he's in the southpaw stance against the or against the orthodox fighter in Barbosa then he can have some success and potentially box up Edson but I don't see that happening man I think the kicking game uh, the power and the speed of Barbosa is going to be way too much for Super Sadiq so I'm going to take Edson Barbosa to defeat Sadiq Youssef via a second round knockout as an early pick. I Like I said, I just think he's going to be way too fast and way too powerful. And he has the kicking game to mix up with 
you know, which Yusuf has good kicks as well, but it's no match for Edson Barbosa. And we've seen Barbosa be able to make 145, be able to compete with the highest level of the division. And um, I think we see another signature Barbosa performance coming off that knockout against Billy Quarantillo with that knee right up the middle. Um, I think this is an Edson Barbosa showcase to be honest but I'm a big fan of Super Sadiq I do think he's a very technical striker he has very good boxing very good timing with his punches and his combinations and um, it is going to be a tough fight but I do lean Barbosa to get this one done and the final fight we're going to talk about is in the UFC's lightweight division, a banger at UFC Vegas 79 on September 23rd between Rafael Adaman Fiziev and Mateus Gamer Gamrot. Gamrot versus Fiziev is a fight that I think is the perfect fight to make considering the landscape of the lightweight division and the fact that at UFC 291 this weekend, we have Justin Gaethje versus Dustin Poirier for the BMF championship. So we don't know what they're going to do following a win or a loss with those two men. Fazib's obviously coming off that majority decision loss to Justin Gaethje, the man who competes in the main event, but it was a competitive fight, but Gaethje used his wrestling to secure one of the rounds at the in the third round, you know, to really lock up that round for himself, and the jab of Justin Gaethje was giving Fazib a lot of issues, the stance changing combos, but Fazib was competitive, and some people believe that he should have won that fight. I scored it for Gaethje, even though I bet on Fazib, I do think that Gaethje was the rightful winner, and you look at Gamrot, he's coming off that pretty dominant decision loss to Benil Dariush. Dariush is coming off that knockout loss at UFC 289 to Charles Dobronx Oliveira, who's going to be going up against Islam Mahachev in a rematch for the lightweight championship at UFC 294, I believe. I don't think it's 295. It's 294 in Abu Dhabi. But before that, you know, Mateus Gamrat got that controversial decision win against Armin Saruki, and I picked him there. I picked him in that fight to win by decision, but a lot of people thought that Armin did enough to win that fight. I thought it was close, and I don't think it was a robbery by any means, but maybe that's because I picked Mateus Gamrat, but this is a striker versus grappling match, or striker versus grappler match 100%. I don't really think anybody would beg to differ. And if Gamrat stays on the feet, even though he has good striking, good stance changing combinations, good use of the jab, good movement, you know, he moves well laterally. He's got good shots to the body. We've seen him land good knees to the body inside the body lock and in the clinch that he used to TKO Diego Ferreira with in their fight at UFC, at a UFC fight night. He's got great submissions, great scrambles, great takedowns, relentless with the takedowns relentless with the scrambles and if he resorts to the grappling for the entire time and Fiziev cannot stop those takedowns then it's going to be a big problem for him and he probably gets submitted by Gamrot but you look at Fiziev one of the best strikers in the division one of the best technical kickboxers on the planet and a former I think he still might be but he was definitely a former striking coach at Tiger Muay Thai out in Thailand with the Hickman brothers and, um, you know, if Fazeev can keep this on the feet, he's going to outstrike Gamrot. He's going to piece him up. You know, if Benil Dariush was able to get the better of Gamrot on the feet, then we know that Fazeev's going to have a field day on the feet with his beautiful left switch kick to the body, his right low kicks, his beautiful 3-2, the, the left hook to the body, the right cross, the 1-2 down the middle, the 1-2-3, the 1-2-3 body break off with the left hook. The speed, power, and technique of Fazeev is going to be able to butcher Gamrot on the feet, but if Gamrot's able to get in the face of Fazeev, get him to worry about the take downs, land some combinations off the break, and constantly be in the face and wear out Fazeev, then I think he can definitely win this fight, potentially winning a decision by accruing top control time and getting a lot of takedowns, or locking up a submission once he tires out Fazeev, potentially finding a way to his back in a scramble, finding a way to grab the, the Kimura grip and flip him over with the butterfly hook and step over to get the Kimura. I definitely think Gamrot has a shot here, and this is a fight between two of the best lightweights in the entire division, two of the best lightweights in the world, but you have to look at Fazeev and having a 90% takedown defense. I know he got taken down a few times by Rafael Haf uh, Dos Anjos. I know he got taken down in the third round against Gaethje because he wasn't expecting it, but he's going to be expecting those takedowns against Gamrot. I definitely think Gamrot's a live dog here. I think this is a very close fight, and like I said, striker versus grappler. If Fazeev keeps it on the feet, he outstrikes Gamrot and probably finishes him. If Gamrot can continue to get in on the hips of Fazeev, take him down with relentless pressure, relentless top control, and relentless scrambling ability, then Gamrot wins this fight. He either wins a decision or he finds a way to tire him out, ground and pound him, and then look to submit Rafael Fazeev. Um, and I, I actually messed up. I said that Gamrot's last fight was against Benil Dariush. It was actually against Jalen Turner at UFC 285 where he got caught on the feet a few times, but the wrestling, the takedowns, the top control, um, almost knocking out or TKOing 
Jalen Turner from the crucifix position allowed him to win that fight via decision that was a fight where I backed Mateus Gamrot and I felt like I was one of the only people who backed him because a lot of people were on the Jalen Turner hype train at that point. But then I went to the Turner hype train against Hooker and Hooker beat the crap out of Jalen Turner in the second and third round. So, you know, sometimes you just can't get a read on certain fighters. But, you know, Gamrot gets those takedowns, works the top control, outscrambles Fazeev, you know, gets the side control, the crucifix and mount. He beats Fazeev and probably submits him. If Fazeev stops the takedowns with that 90% takedown defense, keeps it on the feet and kickboxes with Gamrot, he knocks Gamrot out but I'm going to actually side with Fazeev because of his absolute standout takedown defense at a 90% but I do think Gamrot's going to be the most relentless wrestler that he's faced in his UFC career and he doesn't just shoot one takedown he shoots one takedown attempt to chain wrestle and use you know three four five takedown attempts until he gets you down and once he gets you down he's like a dog on the bone going for the submission so it is very close but I am going to lead lean with the standout striker in Rafael Fazeev with the stellar takedown defense to be able to keep it on the feet and outstrike Mateus Gamrot potentially finishing him later on in the fight. I don't know if it's a three-rounder or a five-rounder. If it's a three-rounder, I'll go Fazeev via decision. If it's a five-rounder, I'll go Fazeev via a TKO because we've seen in the RDA fight, he can keep that power going into the fifth round when he switched stances from orthodox to southpaw and then landed that big left hand that dropped RDA at the beginning of round five. So give me Rafael Fazeev to beat Gamrot as an early lean, but it's a very slight lean because it is a very competitive fight, but I'll go Fazeev by knockout.